Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We are fortunate to be able to discuss a very important novel out of uh, Willa Cather's collection of novels that she wrote. She wrote quite a prolific author. And we're going to be discussing a book that is perhaps not as well known to most of you, but nonetheless was her Pulitzer Prize winning novel, one of ours. To lead the discussion today, of the book and then to have, if you have any questions later on you'll be able to forward them and we'll be able to ask them of tracy tucker tracy tucker is going to be leading this from will cather center so i'm going to give the floor over to her now thank you very much great thank you so much chris i appreciate being asked to be back um i am tracy sanford tucker i'm the director of tracy, collections I think we, we're, we're not hearing you right now tracy sorry the, the oh, sound no. isn't on Oh, it is on. Can you hear me now? No. Anything? Anything? Anything now? Can you hear me now? Still can't hear you. Uh, Tracy, this is director. I'm hearing you, yeah. so go ahead and talk. Okay, great. Well, all right. I didn't change anything on my end, so let me start again. I'm Tracy Sanford Tucker, and I'm the director of collections and curation here at the National Willa Cather Center in Red Cloud, Nebraska. Uh, I joined the staff here at the National Willa Cather Center in 2012 as the education director. And in 2022, I was named Director of Collections and Curation. I am a certified archivist, so I oversee the management of the National Willa Cather Center's museum collections and the archives program, as well as uh, managing our historic sites with a, a great team that I have that works with me. I'm a graduate of Kansas State University and the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and I'm an affiliate fellow of the Center for Great Plains Studies at the university as well and a member of the Society of American Archivists and the Collections Care and Conservation Alliance. As I said, our organization is located here in Red Cloud, Nebraska, and Red Cloud was the small town where Cather spent some of her most formative years between the ages of about 10 and 16. She used the settings and the events in Red Cloud to inspire six of her novels, uh, six out of the 12, and a number of shorter works of of fiction as well. Our organization, which was begun in 1955, is a 501c3 not-for-profit organization that is dedicated to advancing the work of Willa Cather and preserving the historical settings um, that she wrote about and the archival materials that help us, uh, that help to inform our understanding of those writings. We own and maintain the nation's largest collection of historic sites dedicated to an American author. And to learn more about our work in Red Cloud, I encourage you to visit our website, uh, www.willacather.org, or come and visit us in Red Cloud. We'd be glad to see you. So Bill, if you're uh, listening, if you advance our slide, we should be on the slide with the one of ours dust jacket, the blue cover. Perfect. Um, well, in 2022, we celebrated the centenary of one of ours, the 100th anniversary of its publication. And as Chris noted, Willa, this was Willa Cather's Pulitzer Prize winner for the novel. And during 2022, we made a number of interesting archival connections that deepened our understanding of this award-winning book. The Cather based this book on the life and the death of her first cousin, Grovner Phillips Cather, who lived in nearby Bladen, Nebraska, just a few miles up the road. The book follows Claude Wheeler, a fictionalized GP Cather, from uh, his farm in Nebraska, to college, to the battlefields of France during the First World War. And the entirety of the text is rich with inspiration from real life, from um, 
all the way from you know farm experiences to the shipboard diary of Dr. Frederick Sweeney. God knows I never wanted to write a war story, Cather wrote to her friend Dorothy Canfield Fisher. I lost six months refraining from putting pen to paper on this one, but it stood between me and anything else. When we read the novel today and we look closely at the compelling story behind it, it's really hard to imagine that Cather could have ever considered passing this one by, but she says that she did. So if we can advance to the next slide, please. So Cather continued by telling Fisher, my cousin Grosvenor was born on the farm next to my father's. I helped to take care of him when he was little. We were very much alike and very different. He never could escape from the misery of being himself, except in action. And whatever he put his hand to turned out either ugly or ridiculous. There were years when we avoided each other. He had a contempt for my way of escape and his own ways led to absurdities. I was staying on his father's farm when the war broke out. Next slide, please. And picture here just for a frame of reference. Um, this is a picture taken on the farm, George Cather's farm. And GP is in the hat under the canopy of the tractor here. Willa Cather continues in her letter to Fisher. We spent the first week hauling wheat to town. On those long rides on the wheat, we talked for the first time in years. And I saw some of the things that were really in the back of his mind. I went away and forgot. I no more thought of writing a story about him than of writing about my own nose. It was all too painfully familiar. It was just to escape from him and his kind that I wrote it at all. Now, looking at the sort of the, the backstory of the Cather family, it has to be said that Grosvenor Cather, or GP as the, the family called him uh, as a nickname, was sort of a trial to the family. He was born in 1883. And he was the oldest boy of the five children raised by George and Frances Smith Cather. She was known as Aunt Frank in the family. George and Frank were the first of the Cathers to come to Webster County to settle. Their original plan was probably going to be in Iowa, but they didn't find land that they really um, thought was suited to farming. And so they ended up in Nebraska in Webster County. And before long, they were followed to Nebraska by George's parents, William and Carolyn, who had high hopes that the healthful climate out here would help to save the lives of their two daughters, Alverna and Jenny, both of whom were suffering from tuberculosis. That turned out not to be the case, and both, uh, both daughters died pretty quickly after they came to Nebraska. Uh, and then Charles and Mary Virginia Cather, another son, uh, of, or the brother of George Cather, uh, brought their young family, including a very young Willa Cather, to the same area out in the county and began farming. So if we can advance the slide, please. This is the George Cather house uh, out in northern Webster County. So by this time, we have quite a number of uh, Cather family members in Webster County, and it was a big family. And George's Cather, George Cather's family was big, and they were successful too. Um, all of them were successful. At one point, <coughs> George Cather owned more than a thousand acres of farmland. He employed numerous hired men, and he eventually built this four-story, 27-room, Tidewater-style home near Catherton Farm. It needed to be this big because they had so much land, they were employing lots of hired help, many of whom lived in the house and ate there in the house with them. The whole region began to be known as Catherton, as Catherton Precinct instead of a township. The GP, just like Claude in the novel, had some difficulties. Um, like Claude, he went to college several different times, and there are numerous letters and memos that suggest that GP was more interested in girls and football 
than he was in his academic pursuits. Within the Cabot collections that are related to GP's time at college, there are things like demands for payment that suggest GP was not too attentive to paying his bills or following up on his obligations. But the, the things that are worse than those are the letters from his professors about his attendance and his grades. They're really bad. It's worth mentioning too that uh, GP had never really intended to go to college here in Nebraska. He had wanted to go to West Point and that plan was thwarted by his parents. They, they sent him to Grand Island Baptist College, uh, where he became involved in a number of different activities, college band, a literary society, uh, the football club, like I said. Like Claude in the novel, he eventually left that small college and enrolled in the University of Nebraska, which he did not graduate. Um, after a number of years in school, he left to take a Kincaid which is a 640 acre homestead plot out in the sand hills of Nebraska. Next slide, please. So he had trouble settling down. And one of the reasons he had uh, a little bit of trouble was because he ran into a number of difficulties with young ladies. Um, one of those was Myrtle Bartlett, who would become his wife, and uh, his love affair with her, his courtship of her, um, was one of the major disruptions, really, of his young adulthood. On January 3rd, 1908, he proposed to Myrtle, and while that might normally be sort of a happy occasion, it wasn't for GP, because Myrtle rejected him, saying that her own poor health and the, the poor health of her mother would mean that she couldn't be a good wife to GP. And so she turned him down flat. And in response, GP left for Denver without telling anyone and enlisted in the United States Navy. It took some weeks for uh, George and Frank to find GP to figure out where he had gone and what had happened. And they immediately turned their energies toward trying to have his enlistment nullified. They wrote to congressmen, they wrote to the Secretary of the Navy, they even wrote a letter to Theodore Roosevelt, who was the president, and they went so far as to suggest that they believed he may have been temporarily insane at the time of his enlistment due to his um, being rejected. But no one was really buying that uh, argument. They, the Navy was not interested in giving him a discharge. George and Frank Cather then uh, sought to pursue a discharge by purchase, and that is just what it sounds like. The Cathers would pay a fee to have uh, GP dismissed from, discharged from the Navy. And again, the Navy said, nothing doing, he's staying in. So GP remained in the Navy until his obligation was up. During that time, he was still writing to Myrtle. And when he was discharged from the Navy in May 1909, he sort of took the long way back to Nebraska. He was sightseeing, and he was borrowing money from his parents to extend his trip. And he finally ended up visiting Myrtle in Texas, where they must have reached some sort of agreement because they eventually married in the summer of 1910. Next slide, please. This is a postcard, one of them uh, from GP in the Navy. This is his ship. And uh, he sent a series of postcards uh, back to Myrtle all along his travels. Next slide, please. Now, GP had already lost the Kincaid before he left for the Navy, and there are some sketchy details that aren't really clear about the circumstances that that happened under. So, when he leaves the Navy and he's returning home, the plan was for him to resume farming with his father, George. Um, he remarked in a letter to his mother in 1909, 
that he could, quote, take no occupation, end quote, because of Myrtle's poor health. Now, after the marriage, GP and Myrtle got along well, or at least it seemed that way. They did spend a lot of time apart, and GP was spending a lot of his time pursuing big game hunting of all the things. It was a huge interest for him. And Myrtle was traveling with her mother for their health visiting different resorts and sanitariums. Throughout, both sets of parents are, are supporting this couple. And Nelson Bartlett, who is Myrtle's father, built a brand new house for them across the street from his own and tellingly put it solely in his daughter Myrtle's name. Next slide, please. Now, after they uh, moved to Bladen and they're living in the brand new house, um, GP falls victim to what was you know, considered to be one of his misfortunes. A lot of things that, that turned out badly for him were considered to be his misfortunes. And one of his misfortunes was that he was very badly burned in a garage fire. Um, there was a, a can of fuel that exploded and he had a very long convalescence with a, a lot of burns on his body. And afterwards, after he was recovered fully, Myrtle uh, was firmly uh, of the belief that GP should be allowed to do something he had always wanted to do. And that was to take a weeks long hunting trip to Colorado. And he had talked at one time about his plan being to become a taxidermist and the big game hunting and the taxidermist sort of went hand in hand. And there were, um, there were a lot of um, supplies and equipment purchased in pursuit of this plan. So GP then does go to Colorado and he has a very successful hunt, but the taxidermy part of it was another venture that GP just didn't stick with for very long. And in many ways, GP was the same sort of feckless and unserious boy that he'd always been and very similar to the one that Cather describes in the early pages of One of Ours. Like GP, Claude chafed at, at some of his surroundings, you know, first on the farm, which felt very small, and then at a small Baptist college. The University of Nebraska, it has to be said, offered some more interesting friends and exciting ideas, but he left it with no degree and no career. And so returning to farming was the really the only avenue left open to him, as unsatisfying as that might have felt to him at the time. Can you advance the slide, please? So one of the few threads that go all the way through GP's many adventures is it seems to have been his interest in the military life and shooting sports more generally. After being discouraged from attending West Point, when he uh, went to Grand Island Baptist College, one of the activities that he joined into was the college cadet group. He was their bugler and drill leader. Uh, when he went to the Navy, uh, he saw a good deal of the Pacific as a signalman on the West Virginia. He saw Chile, Mexico, Hawaii, Samoa, Panama, other places. And after his marriage, when he came back to Bladen, he was one of the members who formed the Bladen Rifle Association, and they were a competitive shooting team. They competed in many national shooting competitions, and GP actually, you know, was finishing pretty high in uh, in some pretty elite groups uh, competing against um, military trained and West Point trained um, soldiers. So he really was a, a pretty accomplished sharpshooter. After it was formed in 1913, uh, GP volunteered for the militia with Blue Hills Company K, it was part of the 5th Nebraska National Guard Regiment. And he volunteered in May, 1914 the United States had issued an order to bring state militias to full strength as they began to anticipate that there could be a war on the Mexican border when Pancho Villa was 
raiding the southern border. In 1915, uh, after he had uh, begun to drill with the National Guard, GP was enrolled in a stenography class uh, at Boyles College in Omaha. He was trying to pursue some sort of business, but he was finding that college was just as much of a struggle his third time around as it had been before. He's 32 years old by this time. He's struggling at school again and waiting tables on the side, uh, still having to write home for support from time to time. And he remarked in a, in a letter to his mother on the 15th of March that if all else failed, he could quote, still work for Uncle Sam where things are clean and sanitary, end quote. So it was another year before the Nebraska National Guard was called to service and reported to the Mexican border. The GP did report and was listed as the quartermaster supply sergeant for Company K. And there are some pictures of him here. Uh, I believe both of these are taken in Texas at the time that he was in service on the border. Now that service didn't last too long, of course, those problems along the border were pretty quickly handled. After guard troops were discharged in January and February of 1917, GP made it back to Webster County in early March. So he, can't, he didn't hurry home. Myrtle, meanwhile, had been attending business college in Salina, Kansas while he had been gone. And it only took between the 1st of March and the beginning of May for GP to make his application and pass the examination to um, re-up and to go to officer training school at Fort Snelling, Minnesota. The promise of this was that the officers who successfully completed the course were going to be assigned to drill and train the first half million American expeditionary forces that would go to the trenches in Europe. He reported to Philadelphia in September of 1917, assigned to foreign service as a first lieutenant. Um, the Bladen newspaper, the Bladen Enterprise, reported that the first of the U.S. soldiers entered the trenches on Saturday, October 27, 1917, and G.P. Catter died in action May 27, 1918, just seven months later. Can advance the slide. This is a picture of GP Cather's memorial service in 1921, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. As Cather tells it, that anything so glorious could have happened to anyone so disinherited of hope. Timidly, angrily, he used to ask me about the geography of France. Well, he learned it, you see. I first came on his citation in the morning paper when I was having my hair shampooed in a hairdresser's shop. From that time on, he was in my mind. The two personalness, the embarrassment of kinship, it was all gone. But he was in my mind so much, I couldn't get through him to other things. It wasn't affection, but realization so acute that I could not get away from it. I never meant to write a story with a man for the central figure, but with this boy, I was all mixed up by accident of birth. Some of me was buried with him in France, and some of him was left alive in me. After uh, G.P. Cather's death in France in May 1918, Willa Cather wasted little time in getting to work on telling her cousin's story. My Antonia was set to be published in September of 1918, and throughout the spring and summer of that year, she worked at correcting proofs and placing illustrations in My Antonia, and she was able to enjoy the many wonderful reviews that the book got. But by December, she wrote to her editor, Ferris Greenslet, that she is at work on not one, but two books. One of those, was a return to what she called the Blue Mesa story, which had been set aside previously when Cather started to work on My Antonia, and later it would become the book The Professor's House. The other book she was at work on 
was, quote, the soldier story. Next slide, please. The Cather had some difficulty um, in trying to realize her vision for this novel, this, the, the war novel. She simply didn't know enough about the mechanics of troop movement and other logistics of the war. And that makes complete sense. But why would she uh, know those things when newspapers and letters home, all of those things would have been redacted for safety of, of the military. Dr. Frederick Sweeney, who was a small town doctor in Jaffrey, New Hampshire, uh, was called out whenever a guest took ill at the Shattuck Inn in Jaffrey. And in 1918, I'm sorry, 1919, he was just back from his military service in the medical corps in France. The patient he was called to see was Willa Cather, who had contracted influenza while on a working vacation in Jaffrey. Next slide, please. It was Sweeney's habit to talk with his patients. He had treated Cather before and knew her relatively well. He frequently talked of his war experiences and one of them uh, that was particularly vivid for him was a shipboard outbreak of influenza on his way to France. When Cather asked if Sweeney kept a diary, he replied that he had and reluctantly agreed to loan it to Cather. The diary itself uh, is full of a lot of things that may or may not make it into the book, but it gave many details of the ship itself. Um, its crew, its size, the food. Um, one of the more graphic portions of the, of the diary are the details of the flu epidemic, the ominous nosebleed, uh, at the outset of the influenza, the lack of medicine, the burials at sea. Cather wove all these details into her story in you know, her own masterful way, even describing Dr. Sweeney. Uh, when she describes the, the shipboard doctor, she writes, the doctor was a New Englander. He was a brisk, trim man with piercing eyes, clean cut features, and gray hair just the color of his pale face. Cather was able to finish the book, of course, uh, with the help of details from Dr. <coughs> Sweeney's diary and uh, with conversations that she had with returning soldiers and writers, including Dorothy Canfield Fisher, who spent some time in war service uh, in France. And following on the heels of the commercial success of My Antonia, one of ours sold really well right from the outset. Uh, it was published on September 8th, 1922, and within weeks, Cather was receiving letters, many of them from veterans of the Great War. Many former soldiers commended her for her portrayal of the war, despite the sharp criticism that was so famously leveled against the book by Ernest Hemingway. In a letter dated the 25th of November, 1923, Hemingway lashed out at one of ours uh, because it, it was so successful. He didn't believe, uh, for example, that a woman could write convincingly about the war. Wasn't that last scene in the lines wonderful, he wrote? Do you know where it came from? The battle scene in Birth of a Nation. I identified episode after episode, catherized, he called it. Poor woman, she had to get her war experience somewhere. I, I feel compelled to mention every time I read this quote by Ernest Hemingway that um, he had not yet published any novel at the time he makes this statement and it had really only published a few short stories and some poems. So it's pretty wild to think uh, of him calling an author of Cather's stature out in that way, even in a private letter. But Hemingway was certainly not the only one who was critical of the book. Sidney Howard reviewed the book for the bookman and concluded that one of ours, quote, seems to show what a woman can write supremely and what she cannot write at all. The pity is that Miss Cather did not know the war for the big bow wow stuff that it is and stick to her own, own farms and farmer folk. The fact that a woman had written the book was for many critics, the biggest flaw the book 
could possibly have had. Next slide, please. But as I said, Cather did receive a lot of positive responses as well, dozens of them from soldiers and families who had read and appreciated her story of the Great War. And as Cather frequently did, she kept her favorite letters from her readers and shared them with friends and family, particularly those who had offered encouragement and support as the book was created. Um, our manuscript, one of our manuscript collections, the WCPN Manuscript Collection here at the National Willie Cather Center, contains eight of these letters, which likely spent at least some time filed by Cather in a special one of ours envelope, which came into our collection separately. And you can see that the one of ours envelope there uh, with some of the letters that um, probably belonged in it. Charles Bailey Jr. was a bookseller uh, from the Upper Great Plains, and he wrote to Cather, My dear Miss Cather, it was more than kind of you to gratify my request for your signature. I should have written you at once to express my thanks, but I have had an injury to my hand and am only today able to use a pen. If the book is making enemies as well as friends, you may be sure that there are few. One of ours is one of those joys of a bookseller, a really splendid book which can be sold to any customer. Ours is a small shop and a personal one. We know most of our customers pretty well and they rely upon us to a large extent. They all like one of ours. I take a great deal of pleasure in selling it because I'm so keen about it myself. So far, it's running far ahead of Babbitt, this freedom and glimpses of the moon. Perhaps you'll be interested to know that I was in France for over three years, first with the French Foreign Legion and later with the Americans. And I think that the last part of one of ours is the most perfect picture of the war that I have read. With many thanks and all good wishes for the success of one of ours, I am Charles Bailey Jr. Yes, you can go to the next slide, thanks. And this one from Carolyn Hornbacher. My dear Miss Cather, your message came straight to my heart. The last 10 pages of your book was written especially for the mothers, and as one of them, I thank you. We know, but I cannot understand how you do. Sincerely yours, Carolyn Hornbacher, mother of John Morton Walker, whose body lies in France. In 1923, the book received the Pulitzer Prize, although with hesitations. The Pulitzer Committee secretary recorded, I beg to report that the committee recommends for the Pulitzer Prize to be awarded for the best American novel to one of ours by Miss Willa Cather. I might perhaps add that this recommendation is made without enthusiasm. The committee, as I understand its feeling, assumes that the trustees of the fund desire that award should be made each year. In that case, we're of the opinion that Miss Cather's novel, imperfect as we may think it in many regards, is yet the most worthwhile of any in the field. Many have also claimed that the award was more deserved for my Antonia. Others have claimed that it was a protest vote, a way for the committee to again refuse to give a prize to Sinclair Lewis, who was publicly feuding with the Pulitzer Committee and had alienated them. The committee did not elaborate on what shortcomings they believed the novel had. Cather talked a bit about her technique and the differences between one of ours and her past books when she wrote to a friend, I've held the rain tight on him referring to the character Claude. I've cut out all the pictures. I believe it's pictures that I'm supposed to do best because he wasn't much of the picture scene kind. I've allowed myself very few accessories to work with, not one pretty phrase, not one description to comment upon. This was the beginning of a long phase for Cather of experimentation in form and style one that she continued with the professor's house and death comes for the archbishop. This was also one of the last times that she would use her family um, for such 
a deep inspiration, not for, she wouldn't use them again for a depiction like this one that hewed so close to the bone and was so thorough uh, in its, in its uh, motivations. The Pulitzer that she received uh, propelled Cato to even, even higher heights in her literary fame. She was secure after Myantinia. This put her on another level. After GP's death and his posthumous citation for bravery, Cather had written to her aunt, how proud and thankful to God this citation must make you, in spite of all your grief. How proud it must have made GP too, and how thankful to feel in himself the calm courage to do things like this at a time that mercilessly sorts base men from true. A dozen people have telephoned me today to ask if that splendid man who headed the list of splendid men in all the papers were any kin of mine. He has covered us all with a credit we do not deserve, none of us except you and Uncle George. So in Cather's sesquicentennial year this year, as she turns 150 years old, we hope to reconsider Cather's legacy and her writing to suss out the kinds of things that help to keep literature alive and relevant in our lives today. One of the things that has always struck me about Willa Cather is that there is a tendency for people to talk about her Prairie Trilogy, which is a phrase that really ties me in knots. Um, usually if someone mentions Prairie Trilogy, they're talking about O Pioneers, My Antonia, and the Song of the Lark. The Cather wrote six novels about life on these plains, and one of them is one of ours. For me, from the very first time I read it, one of ours was a Nebraska story. It's maybe even the quintessential Nebraska story. It's about a boy who grows up wanting something bigger. It's a boy who wants to be something more and doesn't know how to get it. But there are more important, um, you know, there are other important stories that are contained within this novel. They're, they're smaller stories, but they speak to the breadth of experiences here on the plains. One of ours is the universal story of change and how people struggle against it and are swept along by it. Claude, by turns, is irritated by technology and tired of everything old fashioned. When his brother insists on newfangled labor-saving machines for the farm, Claude protests that no one will ever be able to use them. As soon as Mahili got used to a washing machine or a churn, Ralph, to keep up with the bristling march of events, brought home a still newer one, Claude complained. And later on, Claude reverses his thinking and notes that the wheelers never get rid of anything, and even the old invalid horses are pressed into service when harvest is especially successful. One of ours is also the timeless story of strangers in our midst and the distrust that can breed between neighbors when bad times befall a country, whether those are economic hard times or a world war. And we can still see examples of how xenophobic tendencies are still with us in the world today. Cather writes about the trial of the German neighbors and the harassment of Mrs. Voigt, the restaurant owner, who was teased by, by little boys, she's called a German spy, Der Hindenburg and Kaiser Bill. And Cather allows us to understand that these people aren't enemies. They're just people who can't become fully American out of love and nostalgia for their own country where they were born. The focus of the distrust might change with the decades, but it seems to always be with us. And then too, there's the sad reconciliation between the noble ideas that send a young man to war and the mundane gruesomeness of the actual fight. Claude called the war a miracle in one part of the book, the roughnecks own miracle. It was their golden chance, he wrote. And Claude reflected that Three years ago, he used to sit moping by the window because he didn't see how a Nebraska farmer boy had any call or indeed any way to throw himself into the struggle. The feeling of purpose, 
a fateful purpose was strong in his breast. And at the end of the book, though, David Gerhardt's death. David Gerhardt is obliterated as he runs through an enemy barrage to try to find a group of lost soldiers from Missouri. And the whole image seems emblematic of war. Ample courage, for sure, but coupled with death and confusion and waste at almost every turn. One of ours is the universal story of mothers grieving their lost sons, sons that might be lost in a hundred different ways. And it's telling that Catter didn't choose to follow the story through to GP's burial in France or to his body's repatriation and return to Nebraska for that elaborate funeral service in 1921, or even to the end of the war. Instead, she ends one of ours with Claude, not as a physical being, but as an idea, as a memory, and one that's always safe from the disappointment in the world. She wrote, to the two old women who work together in the farmhouse, the thought of Claude is always there, beyond everything else, at the farthest edge of consciousness, like the evening sun on the horizon. For him, the call was clear, the cause was glorious. They were the ones who had hoped extravagantly, who in order to do what they did, had to hope extravagantly and to believe passionately. Willa Catter's Aunt Frank died just a few months before one of ours was published. So she, she died believing that GP had been saved in some way. But one of ours, Catter believed, lost her quite a few friends. Poor Claude seems to have kicked up the devil of a row, she wrote to her sister. He is not regarded as a story at all, but as an argument, as everything he is not. Lots of my old best friends don't like it. Mencken thinks it's a failure. Fanny Butcher wails forth her disappointment. Well, we never get anything for nothing in life or in art. I gained a great deal in mere technique in that book, and I lose my friends. Sinclair Lewis reviews it as a failure in tonight's post. Why the devil should a woman write a war book? He wondered, well, why would she? This one was put upon me. I didn't choose it. The notoriety of the book itself and the Pulitzer Prize the following year helped to cement Cather's reputation and her career. But she'd been nervous about showing it to people and had kept quiet about it being a novel with war elements in it. There was pride in her work. And there was also a fair amount of pain. After a a hand-signed limited edition of the book had been issued. Catter told her friend Fisher, you see vellum and hand laid paper mean nothing to me. What did vellum mean to Claude or to his dear, dear mother? Thanks so much for listening. I hope you have lots of questions and comments about the book. I'm happy to answer if you do. Thanks so much, Tracy. That was, that was very interesting. Uh, lots of great information to think about and ponder. One question we have is, do you feel that the book was, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, do you feel that today the, the negative, um, the negative criticism coming essentially from men early on in the book, um, or early on when the book was released, do you feel that that may have had really long term effect on the book not being as popular as the trilogy is today. It could have. Um, it, it's really funny. Uh, I didn't expect much out of the book when I read it the first time. And I have to say that was the first thing I knew about the book was how much Ernest Hemingway reacted strongly against it and other critics as well. Um, I think it might be a fair uh, criticism. It, it, it is not, as just as the committee said, it is not without flaws. But in many places, I think it is just a beautiful book and, and the equal of my Antonia. But it is, there is a lot more to unpack. And um, there have been many readers who've told me that some of the war stuff is just very difficult for them to handle. So there are moments of discomfort in the reading, I think, too. 
that makes sense. I, I, I think, too, you know, there was a long tradition, especially looking into the 19th century, into the early 20th century. There was a growing tradition, I should say, of, of female authors being given the space of the rural, you know, being able to write like Beatrix Potter. You can think of children's stories talking about the, the, the kind of rural area. Uh, of course, um, uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder would be another example of this, too. And it, it's, it's almost as if people were comfortable with her writing about, you know, rural America. But when she started to talk about things of a more universal nature, they felt that she was maybe out overstepping her bounds. Yeah, I think that's very, um, I think that's very true. Um, you know, that's how human brains work. You want to put people in, in a box. And I, I think it's interesting though. And, I, you know, I don't have any sort of numbers to back this up. Um, so it'd be really interesting to do some work with uh, bigger data and find out if this is just um, something that sticks out to me because of my own reading choices. But I think of Rebecca West writing The Return of the Soldier, which was pretty early, 1917, 18, some, somewhere in that neighborhood. Cather winning the Pulitzer for one of ours. There are a lot of women writing about World War I. And I, you don't hear the, the kind of fuss kicked up as you do about Willa Cather. And I'm curious about that. I, I readily admit I don't know uh, what might have uh, spurred that kind of thing, but I'm, I'm very curious and, and interested to know more. Another question that we have here, we've got another question here that you can see on the screen. Great, William. Hi, William. Um, could you talk more about the main character's struggle, struggle with his masculinity and how Cather's perspective uh, lends to maybe a more nuanced portrayal of him. I think poor Claude struggles with masculinity in a lot of ways. And um, for anyone who hasn't finished the novel or maybe is just thinking about starting it, not to give too much away here, but um, one of the most interesting um, parts of the novel for me is uh, Claude marries Enid, his wife, and is immediately locked out of the honeymoon suite and they're, when they're traveling to their honeymoon. And so uh, that's bad enough, but it's, it's set against a scene where they're talking about Enid raising chickens when they're back on the farm. And Enid has some newfangled uh, agricultural ideas in that she doesn't believe in having any males in the flock. And of course, chickens lay eggs whether there are roosters around or not. And so um, to me, I think Cather is talking a lot about the modern woman and what that may or may not do to men's roles. And I think there's some interesting things happening um, the, the sort of that homosocial space of the military. Um, I think Claude definitely feels more comfortable there. If you're looking at his college experiences and his mostly male sets of friends and how he sort of comes into his own when he gets into a more structured military life where there are not a lot of women around, um, I think Catter's She's definitely projecting much uh, further beyond just GP Cather's life here. She's she's looking at bigger social trends. I think that's not a very good answer, William. I think there's too much to unpack there, but it's a great question and something fun to think about. Uh, we have another question <clears throat> via text. So this question is: What uh, you mentioned in your talk that. Uh, this kind of spurs off some experimentation in her career that uh, also happens in Death Comes for the Archbishop. Uh, this is a person who attended our Death Comes for the Archbishop talk that we had last year. And so wanted to know what similarities do you see, Tracy, or what convergence do you see between these two novels? Well... I think, uh, so when she's writing about how she's deliberately trying to like tone down the imagery 
and she's trying to tone, you know, pare, pare back the language a little bit. I think that is a, you know, like that's a direct um, forerunner to what she does in Death Comes for the Archbishop. When she writes about Death Comes for the Archbishop, she explains to people that she is trying to attempt a technique where all of the events of the novel have roughly the same um, the same sort of uh, what would I call it the same sort of uh, temperature, right? If you think about a novel and the how you might plot a novel, you know the old classic um, graph where you have you know uh, leading action and then you have the the you know the climax of the story up here. In Death Comes for the Archbishop, Canada is trying to make a flat graph. And I don't think one of ours is quite there, but it is much more subdued. It's not like my Antonia that has lots of, you know, peaks and valleys where things are exciting and then, um, you know, more calm. I think this is just Canada playing with um, things that she might do. And I, it's not as pronounced as, as death comes for the archbishop. That's clearly, in my opinion, I think that's the masterpiece if that's what she's going for. But this is this is an early experiment in that. Ah, Chris wants to know, was there any response from Myrtle or her family about the novel and did they equate Myrtle with Enid? You know, I don't know if I know that. Myrtle did live for quite some time. And I don't think I've ever read anything. Um, you know, Aunt Frank had passed away before GP died. I don't think even in all of my reading of George Cather's materials, and he, you know, he lived for several years after. Uh, I don't believe I read anything where he directly addresses one of ours. Now, we do have a number of things in our collection uh, that, that came to us from other descendants of the George Cather family. Um, and from what I, what I was told from their family stories was that the things that belonged to GP were highly revered and, and kept and passed down. One of the things we got most recently was uh, GP's bugle from his time at the Grand Island Baptist College. And um, it was passed down through the family and, and everyone was very you know, proud to have this association with, with both him and with the novel. So Edith's family, that might be a different story, but GP's family, Go out on a limb and say that I think they felt good about this depiction. Got one more here. Um, last okay. one has to do with the going back to uh, the female perspective of World War One. So, um, could you talk a little bit? about your observations, your personal observations of the different ways that specifically Willa Cather, but you could also talk about uh, other female um, authors of the time, because you mentioned that other people were writing, other women were writing about World War I in comparison to the way that Hemingway writes about war. Well, I think, uh, you know, so one of the first uh, World War I books I read was, um, Rebecca West's Return of the Soldier. And Return of the Soldier uh, opens with uh, the announcement that one of the soldiers is going to be returning home. This woman's husband is going to be returning home. And he comes home suffering from shell shock. And it's just about um, his kind of slow recovery and then we're still the realization that he's going to get sent if, if he does in fact get well he's going to get sent back to a war so it's a it's a very um 
it's not a happy novel and it's not a glorious novel either. It, it definitely focuses on the idea of um, waste and sort of, in my opinion, colonialism and um, the military industrial complex and, and all those things that sort of feed into um, the sort of this larger war machine that has really negative impacts on individual people. And so maybe my perspective of reading one of ours is colored by some of those ideas, because that's what I see in Cather's novel. I see, uh, I see Claude as this one individual who has the idea that he can do something really noble and at the same time, there are all these things happening where there is progress being made, but not at an individual level. Like they're doing something to save France, but like individuals are being destroyed, you know, sort of ground up in the jaws of war, as it were. Um, I think there are people who read one of ours and read it as just a very straight reading. It's a, it is a war novel that um, focuses on G.P. Cather's high ideals, his high-minded ideals, and the, his wish to, you know, save Belgium, save France from, um, from the Axis powers. But uh, I think you can also read it the other direction. I think you can read this as that's what the character was thinking, but Cather has this larger uh, body of knowledge that sees the aftermath of the war and can reflect backwards and see how naive some of those beliefs can be. To me, that sort of, maybe that's the female perspective, right? She's removed from the war and is, and Hemingway, I, I'm not a Hemingway expert at all, but I feel like, is it wrong to say he enjoyed the war? He sure got a lot out of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about the question too, and I think, I'm thinking of A Farewell to Arms, the ending, because the ending of A Farewell to Arms is that, you know, it's this very dramatic moment. Hemingway wants us to feel this really, like the, the drama of the end of his book is that, this man has lost, he's lost the, the love of his life, but there's still a baby. And he's, he's, you know, we don't really know in the end of the book, I don't think whether or not the baby is living or dead or, you know, we don't really, all we know is that he doesn't care. He walks away from, you know, he walks away from the moment because I think what I see in that, and, I, and for me, the juxtaposition between that book and this book, for example, is that Catherine's not letting you walk away from the moment. She, she's she's showing you know we would we we're, we're saying women but really i think what we're talking about is caretakers you know back then the women are of course the caretakers of all these men who are coming back wounded and they're coming back with ptsd and the women aren't being allowed to talk about it publicly or openly they're only able to grieve with this and deal with it on their own or in small groups of other women and i think that kind of glory is just rings really hollow to somebody who is dealing with the aftermath the war maybe lasts two years three years but some of that stuff can last for 40 years and now the women are in the right. silent war absolutely and that's what uh, that's what mrs wheeler says in the in the novel at the very end is that she has you know watched as these young men come home and then sometimes die by their own hand whether they're jumping off a ship or they're you know you know taking their own lives in their offices and that Claude was spared from all of that. He just had this one, you know, bright white moment of a shell explosion or, you know, whatever ends up happening. Um, and it's over. He doesn't have time to reconsider. He never has time to doubt or question. It's just over. Yeah. Yeah. Well, th thank you for those questions. They were really uh, thought-provoking questions from our audience. And 
Um, I'd like to up here, first of all, give a huge thank you to Tracy for everything that she's done putting this presentation together and sharing with us so much uh, intricate information about the life of Will Catherine and relatives and giving more to the, to the us for understanding for the story. I also want to thank Martin, who is, is not seen, but his presence is felt right now as he all of the technology for this presentation. And finally, I'd like to thank the audience. Thank you for joining us. These are wonderful. Uh, I, I love to do these every year, and hopefully this will become an annual tradition or something when we can explore these books. Willa Cather is one of my favorite authors, and I know for many of the people who are listening tonight, she's one of their favorite authors as well. So thank you all, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks so much.